Hi, everyone. Um, thanks, Robert. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, building a self-service stream platform at Pinterest. Um, just a bit about me. Um, my name is Steven Barris Novak. Uh, I'm originally from Winnipeg, Canada, um, but now I work in San Francisco at Pinterest. Um, I've been at Pinterest for two years, and I've been on the stream processing platform team the entire time. Um, so I have a bit of experience with Spark streaming, and um, now I'm gaining more experience with Flink as well. Uh, so the agenda for today, we're going to start out with uh, just some background about uh, Pinterest, um, Pinterest uh, streaming at Pinterest and stuff like that. Uh, I'll talk a bit about uh, choosing a streaming engine at Pinterest, um, how we made our choice. Uh, I'll talk about a few of the use cases. And then the majority of my talk will be about uh, a couple of the challenges that we faced um, building this new stream platform. Uh, so let's get into it. Um, I'll start out with background. Uh, so what do I mean by a self-service stream processing platform? Um, basically, in our eyes, we see it as a standardized set of clusters for running um, real-time data processing jobs. Uh, it should be able to service um, all of the majority, or sorry, the majority of the streaming use cases at Pinterest, and it should enable ve developer velocity at scale. Basically, our goal is to allow developers to focus on the business logic of their jobs without having to focus on all of the uh, streaming internals and stuff like that. Uh, and in case you don't know, what, uh, here's a bit of background about Pinterest. We're a visual discovery engine um, for finding ideas and inspiration, such as recipes, home and style inspiration, DIY projects, and more. Uh, we have over 300 million active users, uh, over 200 billion pins, and there are terabytes of data to be processed every single day. Um, so a bit about Pinterest's uh, streaming infrastructure. Um, so Kafka is the main uh, source of data for all of our streaming jobs. Um, so there's, there's terabytes, like tens, hundreds of terabytes of data um, being logged to Kafka every single day. Um, and there's hundred, we have hundreds of uh, Kafka topics at Pinterest. Um, and then we also have two main streaming, or we previously had two main uh, streaming technologies at Pinterest. Uh, the first one is self-managed um, Kafka stream jobs. So um, with Kafka streams, users would have to kind of um, own the whole um, job themselves, um, including um, like uh, deployment and all that other stuff. Um, we actually were very hands-off um, with Kafka streams. Um, because previously, uh, Spark was our um, streaming engine of choice. Um, so we have this platform called Overwatch for Spark, and that's what I uh, had been working on up until this year. Um, so Overwatch. Um, so it's a Mesos cluster. Uh, there's approximately 900 nodes right now. Um, it, it still has primarily Spark jobs, and it has HDFS as its persistent, persistent storage. Um, and we call it a streaming platform, but it's really not so. Um, it's actually more of a low latency uh, Spark batch cluster because um, the, only, um, the only streaming job that runs in it is this Veracity job, which has a little red arrow there. Um, everything else is actually a um, yeah, low latency Spark batch job that runs, usually they'll run every hour or um, sometimes even less frequently than that. Um, so choosing a streaming engine. Why did we need to choose a streaming engine? Um, like I mentioned, uh, Kafka streams, um, we can do true streaming, which is great, but there's very little support from the company for Kafka streams. And then on the other hand, uh, Spark or Spark streaming, Spark, Spark, Spark micro batch um, was fully supported, is still fully supported. Uh, however, it is micro batch and not actual true streaming unfortunately. Um, we also had a lot, lack of connectors between streaming engines and storage systems, um, partly due to the fact that we had this fractured infrastructure with um, a few, few, few jobs on Kafka streams and then many jobs on Spark streams. Um, and then the final reason we wanted to choose a new streaming engine was because we didn't really have a recommendation on a, an actual streaming engine. So uh, the first step really was to, for us to finally decide how we're going to be running uh, streaming jobs at Pinterest from now on. Uh, so this is a table that we made um, comparing the three uh, main streaming engines at Pinterest. Um, the, 
I guess this is kind of an abridged table. We had a lot more information and a lot more cells, but we kind of, I tried to cut it, some of it out so it would fit on one slide. Um, the, the most important pieces, I would say, for us were the execution model at the top. Um, so we really wanted uh, to have uh, continuous stream processing um, and kind of were less on board for the micro-batch uh, micro system from Spark. Uh, we also really wanted incremental checkpointing um, because, like I mentioned earlier, we have like tens of terabytes of data um, that come through Kafka on the daily. So uh, it just didn't, uh, it doesn't make sense to have to do a, check, a full checkpoint every single time um, when our state is potentially really large. Uh, and then another one that was really important was, um, was deployment. Uh, we really wanted to use Yarn as our new scheduler of choice. Uh, because that's the one that we use in batch uh, for our batch jobs, and uh, it's just the one that a lot of the team is most comfortable with. And then finally, uh, performance at the bottom would have been a real crucial piece of our choice as well. Um, but unfortunately, um, when we looked at the benchmarks from each of the uh, streaming engines companies, each company said that their streaming engine was the best. So we couldn't really go off of that. Uh, we did our own benchmarking as well, but uh, we kind of we found that they were all fairly similar. So uh, the performance wasn't as huge of a factor as um, in our choice as we would have liked. Uh, so now I'll move on to use cases. So given that we uh, sorry. Naturally, from our, from our graph here, uh, we did choose Flink. Uh, that's why I'm here at uh, Flink Forward. Um, so given that, we went and talked to our users about use cases, um, what, what they want from our platform. Uh, so the first use case I'll talk about is the real-time experiment analytics. Uh, this was the very first use case uh, for Flink at Pinterest. Um, it was, so at Pinterest, we run a ton of experiments every single day. Um, experiments to see how we can improve the, uh, the experience, the Pinterest experience for users as well as for the advertisers and um, pretty much anyone that uses Pinterest. Uh, and previously, there was not very great um, visibility into how an, how an individual experiment affected the metrics at Pinterest. Um, and so previously, we had to wait for a daily batch job to complete to tell us how the previous day's experiments um, had performed. So in theory, a bad experiment, uh, something that wasn't intended, could cause some real harm for up to a day before being detected. Um, so the goal of this project uh, was to deliver that, uh, those analytics way faster in the, in the minutes, in the 10 to 15, or 15 to 30 minute range. Um, it was also to... Um, to uh, expand the amount of data that the uh, analytics were um, computed on. And these goals, um, the real-time experiments team has been really successful with. Uh, I would love to tell you a bit more about it, um, but actually my colleague Ben Liu is going to be talking about this uh, a bit later on today in the afternoon, so uh, feel free to check that one out as well. Uh, uh, the next use case um, is the ad, ads measurement attribution. Um, running an ad campaign on the internet is kind of like a black art. Uh, advertisers spend a ton of time just tuning the knobs, um, trying to figure out how they can uh, per have their ads perform as, as well as possible. Um, and a lot, of these, a lot of these tuning is based on um, perf uh, ad performance, um, how the ad is currently performing. So they use that information to try and tune it a bit more so it can perform better in the next hour or so. Um, and once again, um, we have this use case where um, our, our customers would really like to have uh, really low latency, um, really low latency metrics, and we just couldn't provide that. Um, we only had hourly jobs to provide this information, so um, it was really uh, kind of crucial for us to get this um, this metric down into the 10-15 minute range. Um, and this use case is pretty interesting because um, it's actually still uh, in development, um, but it will be probably the largest uh, real-time join that we that we perform at Pinterest for the next few years. I would I would wager, but um, so that's going to be uh, really interesting for us. And then this is also a use case that requires a lot of uh, a really high, a really highly reliable and uh, stable platform. Um, so we're going to be working with them a lot to make sure that this all works out properly. 
The final use case that I'll talk about is uh, content quality. Um, like it says in the little, the little blurb here, um, knowing the quality of your content is really crucial um, for deciding wh whether or not you should show that content more to more users or whether you should hide it because it's low quality content. Um, so this again is also done with batch jobs right now. Um, the batch jobs take a day. So we're kind of, whenever a new pin is created, we actually are currently uh, kind of flying blind for the first day, unsure if it's really a high quality pin and we should show it more often and people really like it or if it's uh, not very high quality and we should hide it. Um, and this one will be really interesting because um, A, it, it'll be really great to have super low latencies for this, um, this use case, uh, ideally within the seconds so that as soon as, you, as soon as we start showing a pin, we can know whether or not it's doing well or not and um, determine how to show it based on that, as well uh, as this is going to be a really, um, really huge use case. Uh, there is a ton of data that goes into each of these uh, quality signal computations, um, so we're looking forward to taking that on as well. Um, and so based on these requirements, we gained a couple of things, um, or we, we learned a couple of things that our um, users will really need. Uh, they'll require uh, sub-minute latency, potentially, especially for the content quality use case. Uh, they'll require terabytes of data, not only coming in from Kafka, but also in their state, for example, in the, uh, the real-time join. And then they'll also need some platform-level uh, connectors, such as Druid and MySQL, and connectors for internal systems. And just a few more requirements that we had for the platform uh, from my team. Uh, we wanted to use Yarn as the resource manager. Uh, we wanted to store the data on S3 instead of an HDFS. Um, and then we also wanted it to be really easy to use. So given that, um, I'll move in, or given that information, we started working on our platform, uh, started building it out. And now I'm going to move into the, uh, the main part of the talk where I'll talk about uh, two challenges that um, we faced and um, yeah, how, how that went and stuff. Uh, so the first challenge I'll talk about is log access. Um, so like I mentioned, we're running Flink on Yarn. And one of the huge pain points that came up almost immediately when we started letting users, users uh, beta test on our platform was that um, it is really difficult to find uh, the Yarn logs for uh, Flink task managers. Uh, most engineers in the company don't have SSH access onto the Yarn cluster. Um, so they can't really access them directly. So we needed some other way to expose those logs um, in case of a job failure or just like general debugging, that kind of stuff. So, um, so here's how it looks to access the uh, Yarn logs on a running Flink job. Uh, you pull up the Flink UI, you'll find the job in the corner there. Um, you'll copy that down as well. Copy the host name and port down. Um, then you have to find it on the uh, task manager, or go to the task manager tab, find it within the long list of task managers, um, and you have to match the host name and the port. Um, the port is like the second column there. And then finally you can click through and get to the logs. Um, it's, it's, it's a bit of a hassle, um, it's, but it is doable. Um, so we've kind of kept it as is. But the, the more interesting problem for us, or the, the more challenging problem for us was, what about after the fact? What about once the job has already crashed and you want to see the task manager that crashed its logs? So this is the view of the Flink history server UI. Um, as you can see, it's basically the same. Um, and then once again, you can just grab the host name and port. And then we go up into the corner and you see there isn't even a task manager page. So you, there's literally no way for you to access the task managers from the Flink history server UI. Um, so this was obviously uh, not satisfactory for us. Um, so users were technically still able to use this yarn logs command um, from one of the yarn hosts in the cluster, but it was still really difficult to find the container ID of the task manager uh, sorry, the yarn container ID of the task manager once the job is finished. It's pretty much only available while the job's actually running. So naturally we needed uh, a quicker way, um, a better way. So I'll start off with what we ended up doing, or I'll start off showing you our solution first, 
um, and then I'll go back and talk about like how we implemented it. So this is the the new um, Flink history server UI. Uh, as you can see, this is version 1.9 as opposed to 1.7 in the um, in the previous slides. Um, but um, don't worry about that. We're, we've we've made this change for 1.9 because we're planning on moving to 1.9 in the near future. Um, so it's basically the same UI. Now the, um, the subtask information is on the right-hand side here. And as you can see in the, um, the, the host column, there's a big long URL um, instead of just having the host to port pairing. And so we've actually added a URL here to the, uh, the Yarn logs uh, web page itself. So instead of having to click through, um, well, I guess there is no other option for, um, for Flink history server. But basically, instead of having uh, maybe I'll go back. Instead of having these host and port pairs on the uh, on the right here, we've basically replaced it with a UI, uh, a link to the Flink um, Flink uh, log UI. Um, so it may seem like a pretty small, insignificant change, um, but there's there's a bit more to it than just adding um, adding the URL to the Flink history server UI. Um, so to get into what exactly has changed, I'll need to explain uh, how the history server works a little bit. So when a job finishes, um, before the job manager finishes, uh, before the job manager terminates, it will actually create this file called an archive file. This archive file uh, is basically a JSON file, um, and I hope this isn't too small. Um, basically, it has some a bunch of tuples containing a path and then a JSON. Uh, I'll talk a bit more about what, the, what those both mean in a second, but for now, just know that there, there's just a tuple between paths and JSONs. Uh, this file is then uh, uploaded to this job manager archive file system directory. For us, we chose S3 as our, uh, as our history server um, job manager archive path. And then once you run, when you run a history server instance, it will look at its own history server archive file, file system directory path, and it will download all of the archive files off of, S or off of that path and store them um, locally on the history server machine. Um, and the way it stores the, the data in, in the archive file is basically, if you look at uh, the, inf the stuff on the right-hand side, um, is basically, imagine it's like a, a file system um, mapping inside of the actual host, uh, the, the history server host, and then the right is the archive file. Basically, it maps the path to an exact path on the actual uh, history server. So um, from here, the job slash overview uh, path, it stores the JSON in that exact path, um, in that exact path on the history server. And so it does the same thing for this uh, job slash um, some ID slash config. It'll store the JSON um, that's paired with that path into that, um, that path on the host, and so on. So once the, once, um, when, you're, when you go to the browser and you request um, a certain page from the history server, it actually do, um, uses the same path exactly um, as well. So when you say history server 8080, uh, jobs, and then you give it a job ID, and then a vertice, and then a vertice ID. Um, history server will look up in that exact same path and return just the JSON. Um, so there's actually very, um, uh, I don't have a better word for it, dumb. So it, it basically just takes what's in the path and returns it. Um, so uh, given this information, we didn't really want to um, make any real big changes to the history server, because the history server doesn't do a lot. It basically just stores some JSONs and then returns them when they're requested. Um, and so we still have this problem where um, the archive files don't contain um, some key information that's needed to access the yarn logs. Um, the history server, yeah, like I mentioned, just returns, uh, the, returns the, file, the archive files JSONs. So there had to be some other way. Uh, so what we did was we instead created a hack, uh, a hack in quotes, to uh, store the missing information within the uh, within um, the archive files themselves. So instead of having this logic where the history server needs to uh, 
talk to Yarn and look up uh, what the container IDs are and stuff like that. Instead, um, we, we track this information from the very get-go in the Flink job itself. So we created this, um, this object called the job execution history um, file, and it contains a bunch of information about the job execution. Uh, the most important parts are probably the very first line, the cluster ID, um, which is basically the uh, Yarn application ID, as well as the um, task manager locations to container map. Um, so this contains the host port pair to an actual um, Yarn container ID. And so these are the two pieces of information that we're really missing from, uh, from the history server to allow us to uh, access the Yarn logs uh, UI. Uh, so using this, um, this job execution history object, um, we then basically went into this uh, subtask execution attempt details info um, class and added this extra information in. Um, so this class is basically um, one of the classes that uh, is called as, you're, as we're creating the archive files. Um, so instead of um, just adding the host port mapping um, like it previously had in the, in the uh, Flink History Server UI, we added all this extra stuff to basically uh, generate the URL and um, store that instead. So basically our solution kind of looks like this. Um, the job manager uh, creates this job execution history um, object and then it kind of, using that, it kind of stores some extra information inside the archive file and then the rest is basically transparent to the, uh, to the history server. Um, yeah, so we thought this was a, a, like a nice little, like I keep saying hack, um, a nice alternative um, because it, it kind of maintains um, the, the, the status quo, I guess, for the history server, which is nice. Um, we, didn't, we don't have to add any extra logic and stuff in there, and it's fairly low, um, fairly low footprint within the job itself. Um, it's just one extra object that's stored through the lifetime inside the job manager. Um, so we actually made a pull request for this. Um, we definitely are looking for feedback. Uh, we know it's kind of, kind of a hack, um, but my colleague, you, and I um, are pretty interested in hearing uh, what the community has to say. Um, if you think it's crazy, let us know. Uh, we'd, love to, we'd love to have more feedback or know if there's a better place to store this information, that kind of stuff. Um, so um, that's it for that challenge. Uh, the other challenge that we found most interesting uh, was backfilling. Um, so, backfilling, as they say, you never need it until you need it, is uh, we, we thought it was one of a pretty critical piece of uh, the, the Flink puzzle. Um, in addition to backfilling, it's also um, really good for bootstrapping. Um, or I guess backfilling and bootstrapping kind of are like the same thing, where sometimes you may need to, um, sometimes your job may need many days to accumulate state, and you just don't want to wait that long. So we'd like to have uh, a way to bootstrap a job much faster. In our case as well, um, our Kafka retention um, is only uh, two days because it, it's pretty expensive to have long Kafka retention. So uh, if a job needed 30 days worth of state to bootstrap, uh, it, it, like, it wouldn't make sense to store 30 days worth of uh, data in Kafka. So we needed some other way uh, to bootstrap or backfill a job. Uh, so this is kind of what our Kafka, a simplified version of what our Kafka infrastructure looks like. Um, the important part in this slide is this, um, this green box on the left called Merced. Um, Merced is our Kafka backup um, job. It's not a Flink job, it's just like uh, some other kind of job. Um, and basically what it does is it reads from Kafka. Um, it, there's many instances it reads from all the Kafka topics, and then it stores that uh, exactly what's read from Kafka into S3. So we have these uh, Kafka back, gap, backup files in S3, um, and so we thought maybe we could use those for our backup system, or our backfill system. Uh, and so this is what the files that are stored from Merced look like. Um, each, each file belongs only to one Kafka partition. Um, so by that I mean like the blue files are all for partition one, and the green files are all for or blue files are all for partition zero, and green files are all for partition one. We'll never have a blue and green 
file. They'll always be isolated based on the partition, partitions. And then additionally, uh, the, the data within each of these files is ordered. So um, our, for our backfill um, solution, we decided we'll probably be able to just read from these files uh, in order um, and then uh, use that to perform the backfill. So it seems pretty straightforward, but what else are we, mi what else are we missing? Um, so this is like kind of the dream um, for us. It would be to have like a, a Flink job that can read from S3, and then as soon as it gets to the, sorry, the S3 backup files, and then as soon as it gets to the end of the, uh, the, backup, uh, the backup files, it would be able to transition over to Kafka and just read from Kafka and continue from there. Um, Unfortunately, it's not really possible in Flink um, because the execution graph in the streaming API isn't supposed to change after it's been created. Um, so um, just to elaborate on this, this idea, let's say we had, a, we had a job that's doing like a word count. Um, so it's reading from uh, the S3 files. It's backfilling um, using this backfill source um, uh, Flink. Uh, object, I guess, and then it's, it's passing data into this counter uh, object, which um, maintains a count. The word count is at 251, let's say. What we'd like is to be able to just, through a normal restart, or even automatically, potentially, um, start um, restart the job using a Kafka consumer and resume from the current spot. Unfortunately, what actually happens is everything gets reset. The state is basically set back to zero. Um, and so that's not great. And even with the, uh, the dash dash allow non-restored state um, parameter for restore, restarting the job, um, we would get the counter to have its state still, but the Kafka consumer would still um, basically have null as its starting offset, which is not ideal. We really needed some way to pass the job state and the jobs, uh, the job state and the sources state. Um, between one run of the job with the backfill and the actual um, job that reads uh, live data from, uh, from Kafka. And so we thought, how could we do this? Um, is, there, is there some way that we could pass this data? And what, we, what our initial thought was is, what about save points? They're able to pass a uh, state between individual runs of the job. Maybe we can make this work for us. So what we came up with was basically this. Um, we, we have the job running. Um, the backfill source is running, reading from the back, backfill or the Kafka logs. And then when it finishes reading from the Kafka logs, we would, we would trigger a save point. The save point created at the bottom would have the uh, partition to offset mapping as well as the uh, actual job business logics um, state. So in this case, the word count would be at 251. And then we would restart it using this exact same save point, pass that data into the Kafka consumer this time instead of the backfill source, and pass the counter state into the same counter object that basically was running before. Um, yeah. So we decided we could trick Flink into using the backfill source's state as the Flink Kafka consumer's state. Um, and how can we trick it? Well, there's two main things that uh, Flink looks for when, when restoring state. The first one is the UID value of the, uh, the operator itself. Uh, this part is really easy. There's a u.uid function in Flink that just lets you set that value to whatever you want. So that part, no problem. The second part is that uh, the type of data that's stored in the save point has to match up. So our original backfill source, um, it stored a list of backfill files um, mapping to um, the position within the files um, that we've read to so far. Um, and obviously restoring that data into the Kafka source was not going to work because um, Kafka doesn't know about these files, or the, the Flink Kafka consumer doesn't know about these files at all, so how would it, how would it use this data? So we had to make uh, some modifications to our backfill source to allow it to uh, the, allow the checkpointed state to match up evenly. 
Um, so this is kind of, this is just the, to illustrate the checkpointed function interface in Flink. Uh, it has two functions. It has a snapshot state function and a initialized state function. Um, I'm going to talk a bit more about the snapshot state because in this case it sound, it's, it's a bit more interesting. Um, so the snapshot state function is the function that's called right before a checkpoint is about to happen. Um, so, and it's, um, yeah, so it basically if you have, if you implement this interface, um, then your, job, your operator will, um, will be able to checkpoint and restore state um, as, as intended with Flink, I guess. So uh, this is the Flink Kafka consumer base. I haven't made any changes to it. Uh, I think this is version 1.72, um, so it might be a bit different now in 1.9. But um, basically, I've collapsed a few of these like if statements about checkpointing uh, state to Kafka um, because it's not relevant here. Um, but basically, the, the gist of this function is that there's this um, Kafka fetcher. Um, and that is, that is the, the object that actually gets data from Kafka and reads it into Flink. Um, and then this, this Kafka fetcher has this function called snapshot current off, or snapshot current state. And that returns a mapping between the current Kafka partition, uh, sorry, it, it returns the current mapping between Kafka topic partition to the current offset being read on that partition. So for example, in the, in the example I showed earlier, this would be basically, Topic A partition zero maps to offset 120, um, and so on. So it's it's a big map, and then basically from this map, it all gets added to this um, this union offset state um, object, and the union offset state function, uh, sorry, union offset state object is a list instant or a list state instance. Um, so that means it's operator state. So after this function gets called, um, each each operator will upload this, um, their, their individual union offset state to the job manager. The job manager will merge all of the union offset states together, and that is what gets checkpointed. Um, so a list of tuples between uh, Kafka topic partition and then offsets. And so what we did is we basically tried to imitate that as much as possible. Um, You'll notice that this, this function that we implemented, implemented, the snapshot state function, looks almost ident identical to the uh, Flink Kafka consumer bases um, snapshot function. And the only, the only differences are, A, we don't have the if statements for uh, checkpointing the save points to, or sorry, for uh, saving the offsets to Kafka, because our backfill source doesn't actually talk directly to Kafka, it talks to S3. And then the other difference is that we have this Merced reader instead of a Kafka fetcher, because uh, we read from Merced instead of uh, fetching from Kafka. But basically, with those two changes, we, we basically do the exact same thing. We, call, we ask the reader to get its current state. Um, instead of returning um, previously, it returned the mapping from files read to like the position in the file. Now it returns um, the, the last offset that was read actually the next offset that is going to be read, um, and a mapping from the, the Kafka topic partition to that. And so we basically upload, um, or sorry, we add the, the mapping to this union offset state as well, and then that gets uploaded. So in the end, uh, the two states look identical to Flink, and it can't tell the difference. So with, so um, yeah, so bringing it back to this picture, um, in the in the backfill source, it uses this Pinterest back this Pinterest backfill source uh, sources snapshot state function to upload it, and then uh, in the Kafka consumer, using the uh, initialized state function, it'll download that um, that state back and treat it as if it was its own state. So the the transition is pretty uh, is completely um, seamless to Flink. Flink can't tell the difference. Um, and so the, the only thing remaining for this is that currently we have to actually run the save points and then kill the job and restart it with the, uh, with the Kafka consumer uh, manually. In the future, we definitely like to automate this somehow. Um, and that kind of wraps most of it up. Um, the last thing I'll just mention is just the upcoming challenges, I guess. Um, in addition to uh, that um, automating the backfill, uh, we'd also like to fully productionize Flink at Pinterest by the end of the year. 
um, by January 2020. Um, so we'd like to have some deployment, uh, deployment UIs as well as continuous deployment uh, pipelines. Uh, we'd like to add some new metrics, improve existing ones, that kind of stuff. Um, many other uh, user, feature, user requests, user features. Um, as well, uh, we plan on doing a lot more work with Flink SQL in the next year, um, bounded and unbounded uh, SQL queries and having multiple syncs. And then we'll also be evaluating Flink on Kubernetes since Kubernetes seems to be taking over the world and our tooling teams uh, seem to like it. So we'd like to take advantage of it as well. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you.